Hi there, welcome to the Light from Above. My name is David Kenny. I'm the preacher for the Church of Christ here in Wadsworth, Ohio. Glad you could be with us today. We are continuing our study and concluding it on the Epistle to Colossians. This is part 21 of our study with some help from friends. You know, there's, there's a song out there I can remember hearing on the radio growing up and everything, and it's really one of the more depressing songs out there, although it's really popular and I, and I hear it quite often. And it includes these lyrics and the theme of the songs about loneliness and it says i've built walls a fortress deep and mighty that none may penetrate i have no need of friendship friendship causes pain it's laughter it's loving i disdain i am a rock i am an island uh, those lyrics are by paul simon uh, excuse me paul simon you know it's interesting you know people you know they go through life and they become hurt or you know somebody's done them wrong and, and they get to a point where uh, maybe they just don't trust anybody anymore uh, maybe they've had several negative encounters uh, maybe you know they would agree with some of the things that paul simon wrote about this song and that's very tragic i want you to think about the apostle paul the apostle paul had a lot of difficulties he had a lot of people turn against him he had a lot of adversity uh, he had people that had walked with him to betray him, all kinds of difficulties that he went through, but yet he didn't, he didn't give up. He still used his relationship with friends, with Christian brothers and sisters, to try to improve and further the gospel. And that's what we want to talk about today. And what we want to do is we'll read some passages. This is the end of the reading of the epistle for Colossians. And let's read this together, starting in verse 7 of chapter 4. Tychicus, a beloved brother, faithful minister, and a fellow servant in the Lord, will tell you all the news about me. I am sending him to you for this very purpose, that he may know your circumstances and comfort your hearts. With Onesimus, a faithful and beloved brother, who is one of you, they will make known to you all things which are happening here. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greets you with Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, about whom you received instructions. If he comes to you, welcome him. And Je Jesus, who is called Justice, these are my fellow workers for the kingdom of God, who are of the circumcision. They have proved to be a comfort to me. Epaphras, who is one of you, a bondservant of Christ, greets you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers, that you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. For I bear him witness that he has a great zeal for you, and those who are in Laodicea, and those in Hierapolis. Luke, the beloved physician, and Demas greet you. Greet the brethren who are in Laodicea, and Nymphus, and the church that is in his house. Now when this epistle is read among you, see that it is also read among the churches of Laodicea, and that you likewise read the epistle from Laodicea. And say to Aircarpus, Take heed to the ministry which you have received in the Lord, that you may fulfill it. This salutation by my own hand, Paul, Remember my chains, grace be with you, amen. And we need to remember, you know, we are not an island. We are not alone. As Christians, we have, you know, the brotherhood is very large among churches of Christ. And, and sometimes, you know, if you're a part of a very small congregation, you might sometimes think, you know, we're, we're so alone. There's hardly anybody around. But you need to remember that, uh, there, even during those times of uh, loneliness and things like that, we are not alone. And, and the Apostle Paul has been in prison. He's in prison in Rome when he writes this. And he talks about all these friends that he has. And, and there's a lot of great things that we can learn from the closing of this epistle. And I want to break it down in three main points that we can follow. Those delivering the epistle, those who send greeting, and those receiving the epistle. And there are important points that we can note about each of these individuals and the circumstances that relate around them. So let's start with those delivering the epistle. Tychicus and Onesimus would take the epistle of Colossians and Philemon from Rome to Colossae. Now the Roman Empire had built lasting roads, however, they didn't have a mail delivery system, so these letters had to be carried. Tychicus, you know, Paul praises him greatly. He calls him a beloved brother, a faithful minister, and a fellow servant in the Lord. Now, Tychicus would be with Paul on three major events at the close of Paul's third missionary journey in Acts 20, verse 4, which is approximately 58 AD, 
at the writing of this epistle in Rome, Colossians 4, 7, which is approximately 62, 63 AD. He would also be at the closing of Paul's life, 2 Timothy 4, 12, Titus 3, 12. That's about 67 AD. And the tense of the verb being sent there, it tells us that he's one of the people that carried this epistle. And that's important for us to note. Now, there is a textual variant relating to whose circumstances is being addressed, whether it's Paul or the church at Colossae, and the balance of the differences favors either one of them. But they definitely would be encouraged by the news that Tychicus would deliver and also the information that he would have as well as his own presence. Now, Paul has a great concern for those churches, even though, keep in mind, he is in prison in Rome, and that doesn't lessen his concern. And he's still able to accomplish great things. I mean, think about, you know, it, sometimes people don't realize, sometimes when Paul is writing, you read it, you think he's out there talking to masses of people. Well, some of the time he was actually in prison. He couldn't do that. So he would rely on the help of friends, and that's important to note. Uh, Onesimus was a runaway slave. He was owned by Philemon. He was converted by Paul, it's believed, at Ephesus. The church at Colossae met in the home of Philemon, Philemon chapter 1, verse 2. Of course, Philemon is just one chapter. So they would all know of the conflict between these two people, between Onesimus and Philemon. So Paul writes a public epistle to them to let them know. The praise of the Apostle Paul certainly would help alleviate the conflict between them because Paul says that, you know, he is faithful. He's beloved. He's a brother now. He's not, you know, you're, the slave-servant, master-servant relationship has changed. And it's something that Philemon is being told by the Apostle Paul. And you can read about that letter, letter that Tychicus and Onesimus would be carrying from his hand. These two would have much to share with the church at Colossae, the status of the church in Rome, Paul's condition, the information that he sent to them to address the problems that Epaphras had brought to them. There's a lot of information that's going to be transferred between one another through the hands of these messengers. What about number two? Those who send greetings. This is chapter 4, verses 10 through 14. Paul mentions six more names of those who had interest in the church at Colossae. It appears that the first three of these were Jewish, and the latter three of the names were Gentile based on the phrase of the circumcision. That's talking about their origin, not their religion. Now, Aristarchus, he may have been a literal prisoner or one who attended Paul in prison. Epaphras is said to be such in Philemon verses 23 and 24, but Aristarchus is not. So some people think that that's what's happened. He was from Thessalonica, Acts 20, verse 4. He was seized by a mob along with Gaius and carried into the theater of Ephesus. They were traveling companions of Paul, Acts 19, 29. Two years later, he would be sailing with Paul in Acts 27, verse 2. Now another two years later, he would be here in prison with Paul, Colossians 4, 10, in Philemon 1.24. So that's a little bit about Aristarchus. We don't know a lot about some of these people, but sometimes we skip over them and we maybe miss some things that we can learn. And when we talk about accomplishing things through other people, uh, that's very important. Now Mark, uh, this is John Mark of Acts 12.25. He had been in Paul on the first missionary journey. Paul and Barnabas had gone and done missionary work together. They brought John Mark with them. John Mark is the cousin of Barnabas. Uh, some manuscripts or some translations may say uncle, but uh, further research is viewed. The term could apply to either one, but further research has pointed out that most likely they're cousins. And they would have a sharp disagreement, Paul and Barnabas, in Acts 15.39. And Paul would go on his way with Silas, and Barnabas would go on his way with John Mark, and they would do missionary work. Well, there was a conflict there. You know, sometimes you're going to have conflicts, differences of opinion, uh, the way things you're going to handle, uh, different uh, projects you have going on. And the difference was very strong between them. But time goes by, and remember Barnabas' nickname, or surname, or nickname, I believe it is, uh, son of encouragement. You know, he helped Saul as he was becoming to known as the Apostle Paul. And probably he was a big sense of encouragement to John Mark. Uh, because eventually the relationship between John Mark and Paul would be greatly enhanced. 
it's interesting, some people sort of wonder, why don't we hear about Barnabas here uh, in this epistle? It, we don't know for sure, but the theory is that he probably had died of martyrdom around 53 to 57 AD. And that might be why we don't hear about him uh, any more about it. Now, Jesus' justice, this is the only reference to him in the New Testament. He appears to have been a Hebrew based on his surname, which was common, and also the statement being of the circumcision after his name. Now, all three of these men, Aristarchus, John Mark, Jesus' justice, were a comfort to Paul. Now, that term of comfort there is broader than the term that we generally think of uh, comfort. This, this term can include both uh, spiritual comfort and also physical comfort. These men helped Paul in his physical condition and also they helped him mentally as well. Now Epaphras we've already talked about quite a bit, but notice that he's fervent in prayer. Uh, Warren Worsby in his book on Be Complete talked about his praying. and he, he pointed out that Epaphras prayed constantly. He prayed fervently. He prayed personally. He prayed def uh, definitely, and he prayed sacrificially. And those are good points to make. You know, we should be a praying people, and we should pray constantly, fervently, specifically. Uh, we should pray, mention people's names in prayer, and we should do it sacrificially. You know, prayer is a very powerful thing that uh, communication, you know, you're talking to God. A lot of times men, you know, they can't do certain things, but don't ever underestimate what God can do. And prayer is a very important part of a Christian's life. Notice that perfection and completeness is found in Christ and his word. Now, Epaphras' interests were for all three congregations, Colossae, Heriopolis, and Laodicea. If you recall from our previous lessons, those three congregations were very close geographically to one another. You could visit all three of them one day uh, by walking. And so that's important to keep in mind. And Epaphras is one they believed. Uh, who worked with those congregations. Now Luke, in this passage, we learn here that Luke is a medical doctor. He is highly thought of for his labors for Christ and not just for his medical skills. But he's also important because he's a doctor. You know, sometimes, you know, the church is made up of all kinds of people. They bring all kinds of skills to, to the church. And, and we should use those skills to the best of our ability, provided they're honorable, and they ought to be honorable and the church can use them. Uh, sometimes we're tempted to uh, not do that. Uh, one, of, one of the groups I have uh, little, uh, I kind of have sympathy for is teachers. You know, we have professional teachers who teach every day. And they come to church and they, you know, sometimes they don't want to be a teacher anymore. They've been doing it all the time. But we need to keep in mind that, you know, they have skills and we should use those skills to the best of our ability. And the same thing with other professions. There's a lot of very skillful, highly educated members of the church. You have definite assets that the church could use. And we need to be on the lookout for that and to try to use them. The Apostle Paul was the same way. He was looking at friends who would be able to help carry on the work of the gospel. And we need to do that as well. Now, Demas... He's mentioned three times in the scriptures, Colossians 4.14, Philemon 1.24, 2 Timothy 4.10. Now, he's put in the same classification as Luke, but four to five years later, he would defect, and he would become a very difficult person for the Apostle Paul. It's interesting, you know, sometimes I mentioned that we read through some of these closing remarks, and maybe we miss a point of something, and I want to challenge you to think about something about Demas. We have religious groups out in our community who will try to tell us something to the effect that God has determined before the foundation of the world before who has been saved and who is lost. And there's nothing you and I can do about it. They have been predestined or pre-elected for salvation or for destruction. It's a very prominent view among religious people, but it's a false view. It's interesting, they'll hold the view, sometimes they'll say, well, if someone obeyed the gospel, then they're the elect. But then if they d leave the church, they never were the elect in the first place. Now, does that make sense to you? You really sort of wonder about that. Well, Demas is one of these instances where you can re really see that. Demas is put in the passage here in the same classification as Luke. 
But we know later that Demas would forsake him. Now, people can fool us all day long. But, you know, you're talking about the Apostle Paul here. And the Apostle Paul was fooled by him as well. Now, did Demas really believe? Well, he had to have really believed at one point. He had to have really obeyed. He just lost interest and abandoned him. Can that happen to us today? Absolutely. You know, we make the decision to become a Christian or not. When we decide to become a Christian, we make the decision every moment of our lives, are we going to remain a Christian or not? And it's something that we need to keep in mind. A lot of people become Christians and they never thought they would ever leave the church. But some, sadly, sometimes that happens. That's important to note. That's important to keep in mind. Well, that's what happens to Demas here. Demas had obeyed the gospel. He's right there in the same classification as Luke. But yet we're going to find out later in his life he would leave. He would actually be an opponent, someone that would defect and go back into the world. What about those receiving the epistle? Number three, Paul is sending greetings to those of the Lycus River Valley. He sends greetings to Laodicea and desire they read this epistle too. He mentions here an epistle from Laodicea. Now, there's different theories about what this is. Uh, some people think that maybe it's Ephesians uh, that maybe just got uh, renamed, that that's what he's talking about. Uh, some people think that this is an epistle that may have been lost, uh, which that could be the case as well, uh, for whatever reason. But one thing we do know, there is a uh, book out there called The Epistle to the Laodiceans. That is not it. We know that for a fact. That is not the work of the Apostle Paul. Notice the church in Laodicea was meeting in the house of Nymphus. Nymphus, the manuscript's unclear as to the gender of this person. This may be a male or a female. Uh, often the punctuation surrounding the name uh, relation to the house is what differ differentiates it. Some manuscripts have his house, uh, such as the King James and the New King James. Some have her house, Revised Standard, New English Bible, New American Standard, English Standard. Uh, some have their house, uh, such as the American Standard. Now either way, this person was committed to the church and even opened their property to the congregation to meet there. Now, current research has found out that church buildings, church buildings didn't really come into existence as such until about the third century. Well, does that mean that, you know, there were no churches? Well, we know churches existed. Well, how did that work? Well, one of the distinctions we need to keep in mind is the church is made up of people. People are the church. Churches are not structures. The early church met in people's homes. Sometimes they would meet in synagogues. Sometimes they would meet in the, open, in the open air. It's something that people need to keep in mind. You know, we have beautiful buildings and all that, but those are not the church. Christians are the church, and we need to keep that in mind. Now, Archippus uh, may have been the son of Philemon, based on verse 2. He was a soldier of the cross, and Paul is encouraging him to press on. Now, why Paul does this is not known. Some people think that maybe um, he's being considered for a leadership position. Uh, we're not totally sure why. And then Paul closes. You know, Paul is using a professional writer to write this letter. And he takes some time out and possibly picks up the pen. And he signs his name. And notice it talks about, remember my chains. You can almost sort of hear the chains clanging as he's writing. So probably they had somebody there who actually did the professional writing. Writing was a lot more challenging uh, for the Apostle Paul at this stage. Uh, that could be the case, too. But as we, you know, we close this up, it, with the idea of with help from, from some friends, it's important to note that Paul has a lot of friends. He had enemies, too. He had a lot of those, too. But notice this circle of friends around the Apostle Paul. He was imprisoned, but he was not alone. He had friends that were with him, and he had friends that were far away from him. But he didn't, out, he didn't operate in a vacuum. He wasn't just out there by himself. He may have felt that he was at times, but he was not alone. Sometimes we may feel that way. We may feel that we're alone, that nobody cares. 
Or maybe we feel that we're carrying the whole burden of everything ourselves. But that's not the case. That is not the case. Paul always knew that the Lord was with him. He always knew that. So he was never alone, even if nobody else was in the room. But he had friends, and he operated through friends. Now, if the Apostle Paul could have friends in the gospel to carry the work of the church forward, why can't we? We should have Christian friends, Christian brothers and sisters. Thanks for watching our series on Colossians. Before we close our program today, we'd like to take a moment and review this roadmap to heaven with you since the matter is so serious. There are many incorrect set of directions out there that people follow. For example, some people have been given wrong turns. They follow things such as faith only, works only, or grace only. Some attempt to change the order of the turns. Maybe they might be baptized before they even believe. Some fail to realize what point they are even on the map. They don't even look at the map, thinking that they're saved already and haven't even opened their Bibles yet. As a person is traveling in a car must follow the road map's directions, or a hiker, as shown here, must follow the trail map, so we must follow the proper directions to heaven. Let's consider the first intersection on our road map, believe God's word or to have faith. We must have faith, which comes from God's word, Romans 10:17. Hebrews 11.6 states that we cannot please God without faith. It states, but without faith it is impossible to please Him, for he who comes to God must believe that He is, and that He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. Jesus stated this, Therefore I said to you that you will die in your sins, for if you do not believe that I am He, you will die in your sins. John 8.24 Our next intersection is repent. Repentance requires a change. We must bring our life in conformity to the way God would have us to be. The Jews who crucified Christ were commanded to repent. Then Peter said to them, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Acts 2.38 Claiming ignorance will not work. Truly these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. Acts 17.30 our next intersection is confess. A person must confess that Jesus is the Son of God. To confess this means one acknowledges both his humanity and his divinity. We must confess, as it says, for with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation, Romans 10.10. 10. If you want Jesus to confess you to the Father, then you must confess Jesus before men. Matthew wrote, Therefore whoever confesses me before men him I will also confess before my Father who is in heaven, Matthew 10:32. The next turn on our map is immersion. Baptism is perhaps the most controversial step in the plan of salvation to some people. However, the New Testament is clear that one has to be immersed in water to obtain salvation. Notice that faith precedes, not negates, baptism. Mark wrote, He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. Mark 16:16. 16, 16. Baptism is immersion which pictures a burial. Paul wrote, Or do you not know that as many of us were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together in likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. We put Christ on when we are baptized. Galatians 3.27 states, For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. And some people try to say, well, baptism doesn't save us. But the Bible is very clear about that. Baptism clearly saves us. Quote, There is also an antitype which now saves us. Baptism, not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 3.21 don't let anyone try to persuade you otherwise. Read the New Testament and see it for yourself. Baptism is required to be added to the church, in which is the only place salvation can be found. At this point, we've reached our final intersection on our road map, the church. One is not voted into the church after some religious testimony. The Lord adds him to the church. Notice in Acts 2.47, it reads, Praising God and having favor with all people, and the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Once one is added to the church, they are a Christian. 
A Christian means like Christ. This means we follow Christ's teaching and example, both in our words and in our deeds. We then must live a Christian life regardless of the consequences. We must remain faithful in the church until the Lord returns and takes his redeemed ones to heaven. We must be faithful Christian regardless of the consequences. Revelation 2.10 states, Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested, and you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. Regardless of what Satan throws at us, we must remain faithful to Christ. Regardless of what governments may do to us, we must remain faithful to Christ and his word. We must remain faithful. So in review, let's take one more look at our roadmap to heaven and look at the steps along the way. Number one, believe. Number two, repent. Number three, confess. Number four, immersion or baptism. Number five, add it to the church and remain faithful. Friend, where are you on the roadmap to heaven? Thanks for watching our program. If we can assist you with further information for your journey, please feel free to contact us. Yeah. Mm -hmm.